This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 763, recorded on June 1st, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, with a light breeze from the southwest. Here it's 24 Celsius, partly cloudy. We had a weird weekend of pouring rain, and then yesterday it finally cleared up. Couldn't do any gardening. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 79 degrees, cloudy. Uh, it has been raining uh, for the past few days, which is good. It's welcome. We're over the average. Right now, it's just kind of meh. We're good. I, should, I said it was weird that it was raining, but it's not weird. It's just weather, of course. And <laughs> my, my memory is that most Memorial Day weekends, it rains. <laughs> Today uh, is non-COVID day. We hope you got your fill of COVID last week. I did. With, uh, mm -hmm. two, uh, I mean, I learned a lot, but I just don't understand why people are writing and saying they still don't believe it came from nature. <laughs> I, uh, I, we did so much. <laughs> still. Yeah, one, one word comes to mind. Parsimonious. So. As uh, Alan's pick said, the gist, they have their gist mm -hmm. and they want to stick. I mean, to, to be sure, many people are grateful and, and learned a lot and so forth. But my goodness, folks. Uh, anyway, um, uh, we, today we have non-COVID, non, uh, although there are questions at the end about COVID. And this is a article in Cell, which Kathy brought to our attention. Hybrid gene origination creates human virus chimeric proteins during infection. <sighs> a little weird in my opinion. Anyway, <laughs> it's third, third, they can name it whatever they want. There are a lot of authors on this paper. No, they can't name it whatever they want. Okay? They can't? No. <laughs> uh, you know, the reviewers can sometimes tell you, no, you can't name it that. Yeah. That's but true. Apparently That's true. it got past them. Yeah. I mean, I know just the hybrid gene origination. Well, anyway, um, lots of authors, many of whom are familiar to us. First of all, there are one, two, three, four co-first authors. Jessica Suk Yuen Ho, Matthew Angel. Angel, Yishuan Ma, Elizabeth Sloan. And then we have uh, two senior authors, Edward Hutchinson and Ivan Marazzi. And then we have a lead contact who is Ivan Marazzi. And then in here are John Udell, Adolfo Garcia Sastre, Nevin Krogan, Ian Brearley. These are people I recognize. Mm, who else? I'm scanning. I'm scanning. That's well, Robert Gifford. Yes. Oh, Slobodan right. Pessler. I was on study section with him. Mm -hmm. Lots and, of people. And from there. all over the place. Is it mm -hmm. fair to say that this is mostly from the uh, Icon School of Medicine and from uh, University of Glasgow? Sure. I mean, the the two the lead author. Uh, there were let me see, the lead contact and senior author Ivan Marazzi is from Mount Sinai, and then let's see Hutchison, who is a senior author. He's at number fourteen, which is Glasgow. Mm. And we have people from Texas. Uh, we have people from Paris, China. Oh yeah. Anyway, oh, it's yeah. a cool story. We hope we haven't lost you yet. So I'm even sorry, it's not yes, coronavirus. <laughs> Kathy, <laughs> summarize it before we start. So, so it's really cool. So first of all, you have to know a little bit of molecular biology, but you may have already learned it from coronaviruses. And that is that most eukaryotic messenger RNAs will have a structure at their five prime end called the cap. And many viral RNAs will have that too. It's called the cap. And there are some exceptions and we're not going to talk about the exceptions. Okay, so where can these caps come from, or how, how do the messenger RNAs get these caps? Well, in the case of viruses, they can get them using a cellular enzyme, they can get them using a viral enzyme, or in the case of the viruses that we're going to talk about today, 
which is primarily influenza viruses, but some others, they, the virus actually steals a cap from the host messenger RNA. And it does this because it has a special enzyme, a part of its polymerase complex, that can cleave the host messenger RNA and get the cap. So, so what is the cap? Well, it's a, it's a G nucleotide that's methylated, and there might be a couple of other nearby bases that are methylated. And it also has an unusual linkage. Instead of a three prime, five prime linkage, it's a five prime, five prime linkage. And this cap is really important for translation of proteins. So proteins get translated by ribosomes. So the ribosome will recognize this cap structure at the very end. And then uh, th this is one subunit of the ribosome. It'll scan down to where it's going to start translation. So if you don't have that cap, you're out of luck for translation. So if you are listening, you heard that some of the cellular messages get their cap clipped off by uh, the influenza polymerase. And it's not just the cap, it's uh, some number of nucleotides in addition. And the median number these authors have determined is around 11 nucleotides. And so um, there's consequences for the host. It's, this can lead to host cell shutoff, as it were. The host messages aren't gonna get translated because they don't have their caps. Um, and it can also uh, therefore, provide an advantage to the to the virus. And the question that's going to get answered in this is, does anything come of those additional nucleotides that come along with the cap? can Can those get translated? And the answer seems to be yes. And so there's two ways that you could envision this. the The amino acids uh, that are encoded could be in the same reading frame as the viral protein. And so it would just be an extension of the five prime end of the messenger RNA that's getting translated. So an extension of an end terminal portion of the protein. Or the upstream part that comes from the host message could get uh, translated in a different reading frame. And so it could uh, go beyond those median of 11 nucleotides and, and keep on going. And as in a different reading frame from the viral protein. And so that's kind of overlaying the region where the viral protein is encoded, but in a different frame. So there's going to be constraints on that because the viral protein has to uh, maintain the amino acids that it uh, needs to encode. So um, th w the question is, are these... Uh, possible? Do they possibly get translated? And do they possibly have a function? And um, so that's the gist of this paper. And they use a lot of really uh, interesting techniques to get at this question. So that's the, the big overview. Cool. So in the, um, in the first case where you have the extension, you may have already made this clear, but in the first case where you have the extension, you would have the viral protein with a, uh, at least a few amino acids from a cellular messenger RNA tacked onto the five prime end. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, tacked onto the end terminus, the mm -hmm. upstream end, the start, the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and in the second case where you have the frame shift, you'd have a completely novel protein. Right. That was encoded partly by a cellular RNA at the beginning and then into the viral RNA, but since it's in a different reading frame, it's a novel uh, amino acid sequence. Uh, I wanted to point out that this cap snatching, which creates, in effect, a hybrid messenger RNA, or a chimeric messenger RNA, that's been known since 1981, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, Bob Krug. Bob Krug and, for and flu, his, yeah. His, his uh, laboratory yep. for mm -hmm. flu. Um, uh, there were some subtleties here, because I haven't really kept up with this story. That the actual snatching happens, am I correct, in the process of transcription of the cellular message? There's a, a, the cartoons in this have the uh, viral polymerase interacting with the cellular RNA polymerase to carry that, this off? I, I disagree with that. Okay. Um, that's in the, uh, there's sort of a commentary article uh, that claims that... Um, the cap is stolen from actively transcribing RNA polymerase 2. 
but uh, well, at least for the bunya viruses, the cap snatching happens in the cytoplasm. Mm. So that okay. certainly can't be the case. Yeah. All right. So you know the the thing is for influenza viruses, it was it was known since the eighties that they trans the, the viral RNA mRNA synthesis can be inhibited by alpha aminitin, which inhibits Paul two, right? And my understanding was that's because the transcripts have to be just made. And so at also, least fresh. Fresh and something to do with splicing, which evades me at this point. Something to do with splicing. But yeah, I don't think it's uh, in transit, as Kathy says. I don't uh, think so, so I have another question that's been bothering me. Okay, yeah. That maybe you can answer for me, Vincent. And uh, if this is too much of a distraction, cut it out later. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, when I go, to, this is a negative strand, uh, talking about flu and the others, yeah. ne uh, basically a negative strand virus, yeah. okay? Uh, and that negative strand is going to serve as a template for making this messenger RNA. So I got the, the snatched cap, which actually serves as a primer on that negative strand, okay? And then gets extended. So now I have my messenger RNA. How do I remake the negative strand without incorporating those cellular messages, those cellular sequences? Am I clear yeah, there? The, yeah, yeah. So you have mRNAs made, but you also have full-length copies of the negative strand. The mRNAs are not complete copies. They miss part of the three prime end. And so another plus strand made in infected cells are complete plus copies of the minus RNA, which are then used to copy to make minus RNAs to incorporate, to package into So particles. did they never have the snatch they, cap? No, they start with a single A, if, I believe, yeah. Okay. Right. There's a really good figure in the Flint textbook that I almost put in, but I thought Vincent was going to do it, and then I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at it right here. Yeah, I have um, it open, too. But I wanted to, I was looking for the mRNA I think camping. You want figure 611. 611, yeah. To uh, show how the full length uh, negative strand is made. And then the next page shows the detail of how the polymerase does it. And then, yeah, and then the cap structure is in chapter eight. Nothing so was here quite we go. The, the uh, inhibition of. Um, mRNA synthesis, influenza mRNA synthesis by treatment of cells with alpha aminitin at concentrations that inhibit cellular Paul II. Uh, this finding demonstrated that the viral RNA polymerase is dependent on host cell Paul II. Inhibition is explained by a requirement for newly synthesized cellular transcripts. Presumably, these transcripts must be made continuously because they are exported rapidly from the nucleus once processed. By the way, the cleavage of the capped fragments is done by an endo a viral endonuclease, and now we have a relatively new antiviral that's an inhibitor of that, which we talked about some time ago. Then, bunyaviral mRNA synthesis is also primed with capped fragments of cell mRNAs. In contrast, bunya mRNA synthesis is not inhibited by alpha aminitin because it occurs in the cytoplasm where capped uh, pre-mRNAs are abundant. So do you know whether the uh, snatch ace, uh, the snatch aces of uh, bunya viruses and flu are similar? I don't. I do not. Here we go. It says so right here. So for flu, we have three, pro we have heterotrimer. The polymerase is a heterotrimer. PB1 is the polymerase. PB2 binds the cap and PA is the endonuclease. In contrast, the Bunya virus do is done by a single protein, the RNA polymerase. Everything is done by the RNA okay. polymerase. Converging evolution. Yep. yep. So, so, folks, you must understand or have listened. This is called cap snatching. Uh, Bob Krub called it that, and the name has stuck. And um, they have a name. <laughs> so what, for what Kathy described... This idea that when you grab these sequences from host, maybe you're grabbing some open reading frame with them. They call that start snatching. <laughs> I think that's great. I really like that. Um, and by the way, one more thing. So we have the cap on the mRNA. And then somewhere downstream is an, is an AUG that 
is the initiator for the main protein or proteins, viral proteins that are made from that mRNA. So that's been called the five prime untranslated region, which subsequently after it was named that many years ago, we recognize it's not really untranslated because there are small open reading frames <laughs> that can be located within these five prime regions before the main AOG that can be translated. They can be long. They can be 10 bases. They can be up to hundreds of nucleotides in length, these UTRs. We have to put it in quotes, I guess. I, have, I remember, let's, let me diverge just a second. I was at my first Gordon conference. I had just, I was a postdoc. I had just done the polio genome sequence and I had just given a five minute talk. In fact, Bert Semler and I, so Bert had done the sequence uh, in, in the Wimmer lab with other people. And so the chair of the session said, okay, you guys can have five minutes each, <laughs> which was a typical thing. So I gave mine. And then afterwards, we're standing in the lunch line and a few people ahead of me was a very well-known virologist who shall not be named. And he was railing about my sequence. And Bert's, he's saying, these people, they call it a five prime untranslated region and they have no idea whether it's translated or not. And he turned to me and he said, do you know if it's translated? I said, no, we just have the sequence. You see, you see what I, <laughs> how could, how do you think I'm, I'm what? A postdoc. How do you think that makes me feel that this prominent virologist is saying, I don't know what you're talking about. In fact, the upstream region of the polio fibroid man is not translated. There are no upstream ORFs, which was found out many years later. But that's what we called them. The part between the five prime base and the AUG, we called it the untranslated region. Remind uh, me, I get to guess later who that is. Okay. <laughs> until <laughs> until the, one of the upstream AUGs was shown to be translated in polio virus and it affects pathogenesis. Not in polio, no, no, no. Yeah, Not polio, the, other picornas. Which one are you thinking of? Um, I thought it was the AUG, the eighth AUG. Yeah, actually, that work. We did that work <laughs> with Sonnenberg. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, so no, there no. Is, no, there was something that came out, and we teach it in my class. Oh, that's right. Recently, yes. you're right. You're yes. right. That was yes. a paper we did on TWIV. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, that, that's true. And, so many years later, well, that is it thirty years later? They, they've. With right. some hard work. I don't remember. Does that overlap or is it a, a discrete uh, upstream open reading frame? Oh, yes. Rich, you remember this paper we did? Uh, no, I, I'm, uh, uh, I was off the rails there for a moment. Go ahead. So, uh, yeah, I can find it in my translation lecture notes, but um, whether it's... That's right. I You're absolutely it's right. Yeah. Yes, readers of the lost... Orf. Orf. Yes. With 522. Okay. Yes, I remember this. Is cell type specific function of a small transmembrane protein encoded in an open reading frame upstream of the enterovirus yes. polyprotein. Right. And Kathy and Rich, you were both on that episode. Yep. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. You're absolutely right. That's, and that happened many years later after. So, okay, for a long time I was right. Wasn't <laughs> <laughs> not really, not really. Until I you understood. <laughs> Until I wasn't. Anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. Should we, should we, all right, so we have start snatching, and then they use another word, which I'd never heard, overprinting. So mm -hmm. this is the idea, as Kathy said, you, you can start translating upstream of the main AUG in a different reading frame, and they call that overprinting, which... I, I understand the need for a single word to describe because mm -hmm. we just would call it translation in an alternative reading frame, right? Yeah. Right. But we're all over 60, so you could argue <laughs> that, you know. But Actually, I oh, think overprinting is not a bad word. I, I, you know, I can do that. Yeah, but we're not printing on anything, right? Yeah. we got to change the word, of, the meaning of printing. All right, so how do they do this? So the, so the first thing you could probably guess what they would do is they sequence viral mRNAs from infected cells, which of course has been done many years ago, 2017, they did a project <laughs> where they infected cells with influenza virus. And then they, um, well, they have a thing called CAP, uh, what is it? DCAP and 5'N sequencing. I suppose they pulled out capped 
mRNAs, then cut the cap off and then sequence the 5'N. Mm -hmm. And they have a data set, which they just look through and ask, um, are there any, uh, so you have to have an AUG looking within the 5' prime non-coding region, right? You have to have an AUG, otherwise you can't start an open reading frame. And they can find them. They can find AUG containing host-derived sequences. So that's the key. It has to be host-derived because along with the cap, it's going to come some host sequences, <clears throat> which they say a median length of 11 nucleotides. And... They find this in all, so influenza viruses have eight RNA segments in their genome, right? And mm -hmm. they can find these in all eight uh, sequences. They say all three reading frames, and they constitute 12% of all cap-snatched sequences. Now, and then some, they, something else I was confused about, because, and I think this comes from some of the supplementary figure, figures where they do homology alignments of the various sequences they come up with. Uh, I'm left with the impression that there's a significant amount of homogeneity. It's not random what gets snatched. Am I, am I misunderstanding that, or is that correct? I, I think that's the implication, but they, to my, for my satisfaction, they don't discuss it really enough at all. They have that one figure where they show... Uh, it's a supplemental figure where they show what kind of uh, genes can be, uh, I think, made by these um, up viral upstream ORFs, or upstream viral ORFs, UV ORFs, <laughs> um, um, and and such. But they don't they don't really address is this coming from some abundant messenger RNA, or is it directed to something specific? You know, the unanswered question. Actually, they don't even say where it's coming from, right? In no. a cell. No. You know, what, ge what gene or genes. Right. That's, yeah. that's what I mean. Other than this yeah. one supplemental figure where it kind of yeah. alludes to it. Yeah. All right. So then they do another infection experiment. They infect macrophages with a different influenza virus strain and they see similar findings. Okay. So you can find host derived sequences in the five prime UTR of influenza virus messages and they have AUGs at the front. And then the other thing they looked at is to see if there if there's an absence of stop codons, right? Yeah. And if that is conserved across um, sequences. So they again look at all these genome sequences that they have uh, for, they use all the influenza H1N1 strains that are available in all eight segments. And they find that the five prime UTR of every genome segment can maintain a reading frame in at least one frame. Right. Every segment. Um, five prime UTRs of five out of the eight segments lacked upstream stop codons in frame with the major open reading frame, which would mean you would get a fusion. Well, you would get possibly a different protein. It depends on the open reading frame, but there's no stop codons to stop it, right? Right. So they have the potential to code for uh, a protein with a longer end terminus, right? Mm hmm and then they find stop codons are also absent from the five prime UTRs of six of the eight segments when they're read out of frame with the major or if suggesting that if you have an AUG, you could make a novel polypeptide, right? It's because it's out of frame with the, the main protein. So you can have an N-terminal extension or a novel overlapping, which they call overprinted polypeptide, right? Right. Which, you know, Rich likes, so we will. Right. We'll stick with that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I don't have strong feelings about it. Okay. Um, so then they translate the sequences on computers. You just take the sequence and you look at the protein. That's called uh, that's in made. silico translation <laughs> <laughs> on chips. Yeah, we used to do this years ago. I just translate it. You just translate <laughs> it on the computer. Right. <laughs> but in silico is okay. That's fine. Um so uh, this showed that um, there, they, you, there's a general propensity to make chimeric open reading frames. 
with half of the segments predicted to make something bigger than 30 amino acids. And these overlap with the what they call the canonical viral genes, but they're in different open reading frames. And these can be 40 to 80 residues in length, amino acids. So they're not huge proteins, but... Big enough. Big enough. That's, that's they can enough. do some. Stretch to big not enough run to have an effect. Code on. Yeah. And then in terms of N-terminal extensions, the other kind, that would be 8 to 21 amino acids long. <laughs> and here's... I, I, this is actually a word I like. They conclude thus, UV ORFs, upstream viral ORFs, are present in all genome segments, and if licensed by host-derived AUG, they could make a peptide. I like that, if licensed, licensed for translation. Right. Yeah. This is I the James it. Bond of virology or molecular <laughs> biology, licensed for translation. Right. Did you ever see the the little image of uh, Daniel Griffin that one of the listeners made? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. yeah. I was not allowed to make a t-shirt with that. They said it looked yes. too much like James Bond and they had that all copyrighted. Can right. you imagine? There was no yeah. James Bond. Right. It just said Griffin, Daniel Griffin, licensed to heal. I guess that's enough of a Bond overlap, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Okay, so we got some what looked like potentially translatable extra sequences. So now you ask, do you find these mRNAs on ribosomes? Mm -hmm. Here we go. We go for some old fashioned, what would you call this? Biochemistry, I guess. Yeah. Ribosomal biology, pro yeah. profiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you basically make an extract of, of infected cells and then you can run them on a sucrose gradient and different, and the ribosomes will, will sediment at different speeds, depending on how many messenger RNAs, or how many ribosomes per messenger RNA. And they use a drug I'd never heard of, Harringtonine. Sounds like a catalog I would get. Harringtonine, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which blocks elongation, but not... So a, a ribosome that's assembled at the AUG, it will, it will not interfere with that, but it will block it from elongating and translated. And then they digest this with ribonuclease and you see, you look for the ribosome protected fragment and you can do the sequence and see where it is, right? This uh, Harrington is really weird stuff because it doesn't block elongation on ribosomes that have uh, made it past initiation. So they all okay. clear out. Right. Okay. okay. And, uh, yeah, and, good, and good. you're left with only the ribosomes that are just initiating translation so and that's okay. a that's a you know diagnostic of an active messenger rna so they, not only so that, that, that gets, not only that but you get some sequence information okay so you can tell what it is so as soon as the ribosome leaves the aug then it's no longer inhibited by it's no longer is inhibited. That right right okay good so you could you could see where the ribosomes are binding and they say you know you, we see accumulation at the canonical initiation site right the main AUG, if you will, on all eight genome segments. And they also see uh, ribosome-protected fragments mapping to these um, host-derived sequences upstream. So, so we're starting to get to answers of this question. These sequences that came from the cap snatching, are they, mm. are they, can they be translated? Well, they can by computer. And now it looks like the messages are being protected by a ribosome, suggesting that they are being translated by ribosomes. Right. And, and then if they do the if, next experiment. If you're interested in the frequency, they say it's 5 to 20% of the initiations at the canonical codon. Right, so it's not 100%, but it's a fraction of it. Right. All right. So, um, then they do some trying to locate uh, exactly where this is. They say it's challenging to map the, the initiation site close to the cap um, for a variety of technical reasons. But then they, so instead they look at the location of the AUG that was acquired with the, with the capped primer to see um, the, re the reading frame that's translated. And they say they can see translation in all three reading frames. So the ribosome protected fragments are in AUGs that are in all three reading frames. Uh, so, uh, Vincent, I'm going to go down another little yeah, yeah, ra sure. rabbit hole here. Um, 
I'm just now uh, waking up to, was there <laughs> any selection done here to be looking at just viral messenger RNAs? Because if you're looking, uh, or uh, does flu actually does do, do, do such a good job at this so that you can be confident that all of these RNAs are in fact viral? Does it shut down uh, the host uh, messenger RNA synthesis slash processing sufficiently so that you can be confident that everything you're looking at is viral? Because uh, if you're looking at just the ribosome protected fragments, uh, you're not necessarily going to see viral sequence. Okay? Does no, that... uh, yeah. But it, but it doesn't shut down um, transcription. It may clear the ribosomes. If of, the snatching of... is sufficiently efficient... Yeah, yeah. Then the majority of what you're going to get are things that would, because I didn't see anything in this. I didn't look carefully at the methods, but I didn't see anything uh, in this about pre-selecting yeah, viral sure. messenger RNAs. I mean, it, the, 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 the infection does shut down host translation, right? So that may clear host messages from ribosomes. But that's, that's a good point. I don't know if they yeah, did anything. I don't yeah. think so. They only say we performed ribosomal profiling of influenza a infected cells i know yeah. that you know with some with some viruses you can be uh, uh confident that the oh. vast majority oh got something kathy yeah yeah ribosome protected fragments were mapped to both the human and viral genomes and uh that's figure 3a and also a supplemental figure set all right so they're seeing both yeah yep uh, yeah, well, that confuses me a little bit because a ribosome protected fragment is going to be uh, about, I think, maximum about 50 nucleotides. Mm -hmm. uh, so downstream from the AUG, you've got maybe 25 nucleotides. Some of these uh, uh, snatched ends, mm -hmm. well, I guess they're, the average is 11. Mm -hmm. So right. that would mean that some of the protected sequence is going to be viral. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And that, that way you can identify... That it's a that it's a snatched viral message. Okay. All right. So the messages, are, these upstream AUGs, they are translated. So now they do some. Well, can we at see this the point, protein, we know right? that the ribosomes are are on the messages. Yeah, the okay. ribosomes are on. <laughs> now we need and, to and, see: do they make proteins that we? And can they're done. Them. That happens less efficiently than the canonical AUG, right? Do they make proteins? So they they do um, two things: mass spec of uh, cell lysates from infected cells. So infect cells, let the infection go, crack the cells open, and do some mass spectrometry. Uh, and then they purify virus particles and ask: Do any of these chimeric proteins get in, uh, incorporated into the purified virus particles? And for those of you who are still hanging in there. Um, <laughs> Uh, mass spectrometry basically is the protein equivalent of sequencing, uh, you know, where you can do bulk sequencing, you can get a bunch of RNA sequences or DNA sequences out the other end. Mass spectrometry gives you protein sequences. So they, they're able to see at least two distinct peptides derived from two long overprinted ORFs in the PB1 and PB2 segments. Those are coding for parts of the polymerase, which they call PB1 and PB2 UFO. <laughs> <laughs> which Oops. stands for Go Upstream ahead. Frankenstein ORF. It's funny. Because it's chimeric, I guess, right? Yeah. Right. And then in their, uh, in their graphic abstract, which I only came to much later, they show... A UFO with a person and a virus in the beam <laughs> coming down from the UFO. So Cute. it's worth checking out. I think you can get the graphical <laughs> abstract uh, even if it's uh, not open access. The whole, you know. So yeah, so they called them upstream Frankenstein PBN. ORFs, UFOs, or yeah, is it Frankenstein or Frankenstein? Frankenstein. If you're watching the <laughs> Mel Brooks film, yeah, right. <laughs> And they also found an internal extension of the nuclear protein NP, uh, which they call NPX extension, would not as interesting a name. No. And they can find peptides from all three of these proteins in infected cell lysates. 
Um, they can also find peptides derived from the PB1 UFO in previously published proteomic data sets. Uh, and they only found this NP extension in virions, virus particles. Um, well, they, they found it in infected cells, but that's the only one they found in virus particles. Because a lot of NP is typically packaged. It's the protein that coats the viral RNA genome. And, you know, whether or not there would be other ORFs in there, ORF proteins, who knows. So, the vir the during the infection... Under the direction of the virus, cellular uh, messenger RNA five prime ends caps ends are uh, added to or used to prime viral messages. So we have chimeric messages, and those are appear to be by these criteria the uh, functional ribosomes right. bind to them. You get proteins made. And they can either be extensions of the viral proteins or totally novel hybrid proteins because they're right out of frame. And I guess these are the most abundant, these three, right? Because they, they're they able to pick them up. But uh, there may be others sure. and you just don't detect them, right? Yeah. These these are the only three that were predicted uh, or that were validated by mass spec out of a bunch more that were predicted based <clears throat> on the sequence gazing. All right, so what are these proteins doing? The next experiment, they ask, can these be recognized by the immune system? And they do a very cool experiment, which I think is part of the reason John Udell is, and his people are here on this paper, because mm -hmm. this is what he does. Mm -hmm. So they take, a, they take an epitope of ovalbumin, which is known to be presented in uh, the MHC1 molecule on the surface of cells, um, to T cells, right? And they basically fuse these ORFs uh, with this epitope from ovalbumin, right? right? They they actually put this into the UTR, the virus, <laughs> and then um, they, I think they infect cells, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they ask, is the ovalbumin fused to the uh, ORF now present? On the surface, and what you can do is, you can add, you can add T cells, CD8 positive T cells, and see if they're activated by recognition of uh, the ovalbumin fusion by measuring certain markers. Mm -hmm. um, so, in fact, mouse cells, the mouse cells are going to present up on MHC1 this fusion, and then they have T cells that are known to be specific for that peptide. They can add and see if they get activated. And they do. These, right, so, uh, yeah, just, just to make it clear, this ovalbumin peptide gets put into the sequence in this upstream region. Vincent right. said that, but I'm looking at the picture and it makes it really clear that if they get this reactivity, it means that this upstream region has to be translated. Right. Because there's no oval, if they use the control virus with none, no ovalbumin inserted, you don't get any reactivity because there's no ovalbumin being placed up on these, right. on this MHC1, so right? To me, there's uh, kind of two take homes from that experiment. One is it's independent confirmation that these things are actually used, that the, yeah. there's translation through the upstream, yeah. uh, uh, upstream region. We can't even call it untranslated anymore. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, also, that the things that are made are potentially immunoreactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, where's the figure that you were just saying is a good one, Kathy? I'm uh, looking at a C of figure four. Yeah. Okay. I got to go back. So figure four, and if the legend's on a different page. Okay. C. So the. Um, Which is the ovalbumin that type? The synfecal. Synfecal is the ovalbumin peptide in orange. Mm. S i i n f e k l, and it's yep. embedded in the longer upstream ORF. Yep. Right. right. It's, it's lovingly known as synfecal. Synfecal. Mm -hmm. so that sounds German, right? <laughs> it's just the one-letter amino acid code. Yes, synfecal. Pronounced. 
Would you like some some feckle for dessert? <laughs> or maybe it's an appetizer. And if I understand the uh, the next cartoon there, they've uh, done it where they've uh, actually, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, stuck that sequence uh, in the coding region, okay, but mm -hmm. out of frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that uh, assesses whether you actually get this um, overprinting reaction happening. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this is a overprinted peptide, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So this, here's something I'm not getting, but you guys can explain it. So the OVA, the synfacal, is being displayed in MHC1, mm -hmm. and that's what the T cells are recognizing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then they make this statement that these results indicate that T cell immunosurveillance extends to peptides encoded by UV ORFs. Mm -hmm. But it's ovalbumin. How do you know the native peptide that's being made without ovalbumin is going to be detected it's by only, these uh, It's only this... I don't get your question. Rich does, so maybe he can uh, Well, uh, uh, um, I, it's an assumption, Vincent, that uh, this is basically... You're sticking a tag yeah. uh, on this thing, and, and, the, and the, the, you're seeing the expression of the tag... By implication, that's coming from a larger uh, translation sure. product. Okay, sure. but that's not that's that's an assumption. It's not proven. Right. It doesn't mean that the peptide. If you didn't have OVA there, I know it would be technically hard to do because I, the I, T I think, cells. Yeah. I think OVA OVA one or OVAL with lowercase L. I think that's just another name for synfecal. Yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, but so I'm it's just not asking, the whole protein. Okay. How do yeah. we know that the T cells would recognize the UV ORFs in the absence of OVA synfecal, which they say immunosurveillance serve, 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 extends to peptides encoded by UV ORFs? Yeah, if you put synfecal in there, fine. But how do you know if without synfecal, if you could do the experiment, that I see. Yeah. it's going to be? So John is listening. So please tell us, John. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Well, they'd have to have some kind of uh, specific peptide sequence for which they have uh, T cells, right? T cells yeah. and yeah, yeah, so yeah. forth that they'd they can recognize. To, you'd have to, yeah, being you'd have to have a way of looking for the native. I mean, I know this means peptide. if you put if you put ovalbumin in the five prime right. region that it can be put up on MHC one. But it right. seems to me if a protein is translated in the cell, it's going to go up on MHC one, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so does this open reading frame ha have any impact on viral pathogenesis? So they can, th so the, for in the case where there's N-terminal extensions caused by these upstream AUGs, they can put in a stop code on. So now you don't have an N-terminal extension anymore, right? So they can do that for NP and for uh, the, the PB1 proteins. And they can make the virus... And they can uh, infect mice. So the viruses seem to grow fine in cells and culture. Um, and um, in mice, the NP viruses, where you've disrupted the uh, N NP N terminal extension by a stop codon, they are less virulent in mice uh, compared to control viruses. And so what does it mean less virulent? That's a good question, right? They are, it's figure 4E. That they're looking at uh, weight loss and survival. You know, it's the weight loss is, yeah, it's different, but I don't know what that means. It's a little bit different. I guess it's an effect and the error bars are kind of big. And then there's fraction survival. So um, the blue is the, is the, is the mutant. It's the mutant, and they, they point, I don't know, about 60% of those survive, whereas 20%, yeah, I guess that's a good Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a pretty big difference there. There's not such yeah. a big Survival. difference in the other one. Yeah, okay. So that's interesting, right? That you take away this end terminal extension of nuclear protein, and boom. Now, one of the things they point out later is that even though these, uh, there could be lots of reasons for that. There could be a fitness issue, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily that uh, these um, chimeric proteins are tinkering with uh, yeah. the immune response or anything like that. It could be just that in the mouse uh, that uh, 
the they replicate better somehow. Yeah. Um, I go suppose that's a subtle distinction, really. They do point out that a similar role for this NP extension has been proposed for the H1N1 pandemic 2009 strain. They say an extended NP protein was found to contribute to virulence in mice and pigs. So, Another caveat in this whole thing is that mm -hmm. any tinkering that you do with the uh, upstream region has potential effects on structure. Yeah. Uh, yep. And replication as well that are yeah. independent of translation. That's and this right. doesn't necessarily uh, control uh, for that. Though these mutations that stick in stop codons are pretty subtle. Okay, they're not mm -hmm. they're not yeah. uh, big mutations. At any rate, this is another indication that these are functioning gene products. Now that was that result was with the NP extension, and they looked at. Uh, the the PB1 UFO viruses, they can remove the so UFO is the uh, overlapping reading frame, right? They can put a stop code on in the in the UTR and stop that. These have increased virulence, right? So, Although they say only when you put a lot of virus in. <laughs> yeah, they never say their doses, um, and mm -hmm. even in the supplemental figures in the materials and methods, if their doses are there. I cannot find them. Uh, wait a minute. They got in the uh, uh, 4F, they got a couple of different uh, graphs there. And one is labeled 100 PFU. The other is labeled 10 PFU. Yeah. 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 On the on the Y axis. I don't know. PFU. I don't know if oh, that's per mouse. I totally or, yeah. missed that. Right. Yep. Okay. Way too subtle for me. Yeah. The 10 okay. PFU, there's not too much difference. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Although the virulence, uh, the killing is really close. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. it's very it's close. These are, these are uh, subtle differences at best. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be hard to sort out what's going on there. But anyway, so the proteins are made. They can be detected. Well, they say they can be detected by the adaptive immune system. I don't understand how the OVA experiment shows that, but I'm hoping John explains and can modulate severity of infection. Okay. Um, then they ask, and I think uh, this is the second to the last, are these, so NPX and PB1 UFO, are they conserved across different strains? And they say of all the influenza A virus isolates in the influenza database, the NPX is maintained in 99.9% .9 of isolates. Wow. But they do say there are many reasons why these sequences are, constrained, are conserved. It could be RNA structure, which you might need to interact with the polymerase, right? So they really don't know if they're conserved because of the protein or something else. But they say whatever the cause is, the result is you make this protein 99. 9% of the time, at least the open reading frame is present, All right? PB1 UFO uh, is conserved in H1N1, HVN2, and H5N1, and stop codons are infrequent, which would stop the production of the UFO, right? They did a sequence randomization experiment where they say, what what if we just randomize the sequences? How how frequently would you get these uh, little open reading frames? So they did that for the PB1 UFO, and it turns out that um, seventy seven percent of the sequences in the database have a, a PB1 UFO that's longer than the fifteen to thirty that you would predict by chance. So probably it didn't. It's not just arising right. by chance, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> then there's a little discussion on negative and positive selection. Mind if I skip that? Yeah, uh, go enough. ahead. <laughs> uh, the point is, uh, as you've uh, already uh, uh, implied, there's. It looks like these are not just there by chance. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, taken together, this suggests the evolution of the PB1 UFO ORF is heavily constrained by converging selective yeah. pressures. Yeah. All right. The last, the last experiment is, you know, can we find these in other viruses? So the answer is yes. You can find them in influenza B viruses, similar experiments where you infect cells and you sequence the mRNAs. You can find host sequences that give rise to either extensions or, or overprinting. Hey, I used it automatically. Look at that. They find it in Lassa virus. Uh, this is one where you can you get priming with capped fragments and they can find host-derived sequences in the mRNA ranged between 4 and 12%. And they could also show um, in, uh, in a... Wow. This is, these names have been changed. The Heartland Banyang virus. Yeah, I noticed that too. Wow. Uh, you know, to, the taxonomists to... have been busy again. <laughs> so this, they have a uh, some cellular sequences in the five prime UTR of this Heartland Banyang virus, and they put a they make an assay system, a mini replicon, which has a luciferase reporter in it that you can measure easily. And they can um, show that this these these open open reading frames can be translated. So that's a bunya virus, I suppose. Right. And if I got it right, the um, the luciferase doesn't have a start codon, so it has to get its start codon yeah. from this upstream viral ORF. Yep. Yeah, they changed the canonical AUG, right? Right. So that seems to be in three these three families: influenza, um, the Lassa. Arena Viridae in the <laughs> Bunya Viridae. Is it quite Although interesting? They call them some, they call them not Bunya. They call what do they them, call them? Uh, Arena uh, Pe Peri Bunya Viridae. Peri right? Bunya Viridae. That's yeah. right. They're Peri Bunya. I don't. I am not keeping up with Jens Kuhn. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Jens. <laughs> yeah, Jens is a member of the ICTV, as are many other people, but he writes right. a lot. Right. Orox. Remember Orox? It's coming up. <laughs> okay, so that's the story. We have these upstream ORFs, which are apparently created when uh, you grab pieces of mRNAs from the host to use as primers. They seem to, the proteins seem to be made. They seem to have some function, at least in replicating in mice and animal models. So they're they say these properties are consistent with them encoding accessory proteins, which means I guess. If you take them out, the cells, the viruses can still reproduce pretty well in, in cells and culture. But then when you go into an animal, you have a problem. I'm not sure that proteins would like to be called accessories, but no, they don't I mean, have a you say. Know, uh, uh, it depends on who's, uh, your perspective. Yeah, I don't know why they're accessory. They're, pro they're viral proteins, right? They're right. part of the virus genome. Viruses and cells both steal each other's proteins, so... Who's to say who was there first? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, Kathy, tell me if this is sexist or something, but when I think <laughs> of accessories, the first thing that pops into my mind is a purse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth's purse. handbag is the perfect example of an accessory. Um, mm. One thing I, I wanted to point out, this commentary by Alistair Russell, uh, he actually says, with without a specific proposed mechanism, these data do not yet support inferring a function for these novel proteins, but also do not preclude such a role. So mm -hmm. he's... That's yeah. fair. That's perfectly fair. Yep. Yeah. Looks wow, like you they're see, made. They could just be uh, fortuitous byproducts. Yeah, you he's, know, uh, gonna, he, he's, he's pretty conservative in his, his interpretation. He uses this <laughs> phrase that caught my eye. Relatively unequivocal evidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that strikes me like, you know, very unique. I'm not sure yeah. that unequivocal can be modified <laughs> at any rate. Relatively yeah. unequivocal. So not quite unequivocal. Yeah. You know, see, so, you get outside of COVID and you get balanced uh, discussion, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to recap, uh, huh, no, no pun intended, but there it was. Um, you have these uh, messenger RNAs that get their caps stolen or snatched from the host messenger RNAs. They include some nucleotides that by computer prediction can be translated 
and by evidence from this paper, our on ribosomes produce proteins that can be detected by mass spec. If you insert some specific peptide in, then those peptides can be recognized by T cells, so they may be functional, uh, mm. and they're uh, conserved in several different virus families. So these so-called untranslated regions might actually be translated and may have some function. Damn, the guy was right. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't know it. Um, so this is interesting. So these viruses have, <clears throat> their, their polymerases need to take primers. And so when you take a primer, you end up getting some proteins with it. And I think they say here, those proteins could hurt you in terms of having immune response against them, or they could help you. And we don't know. Maybe it's both, right? Yeah. So if you steal, what is the saying? You steal things, you might <laughs> get hurt or not. <laughs> um, what they say here that I like, though, is that they say, the important point to be made, conservation and expression does not equate to functionality. And they say, uh, while some may have functions, maybe others are evolutionary spandrels. Mm -hmm. Do you guys like that word? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> oh, we had it before with a paper from uh, Adam Loring. That, that they're the parts like in between arches that can be decorated. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, so if you have an arch, they've put in these triangles, which I don't think you need them really, right? They're just right. decorative, right? Right, right. So that's these things that you keep with the genome, but they're not really important. That's what they call a spandrel. We talked about that also on Twivo once. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe that's where I, yeah. yeah that's where we I can fairly it. surmise that any cost the virus might incur through these ORFs being made is outweighed by fitness benefits of maintaining a genetic architecture that allows for their expression. So I would say um, it's this is interesting because now a lot of people will start to work on these and figure out what they do, right? And that's good. However, now, listen, two more points here. All right, so first of all, 5' prime UTR may or may be misnomer, right? Mm -hmm. um, probably for many viruses. So what, what should we call them, 5' prime regions? No, that's not good. What, you had a word before, Kathy. What did you call them? Uh, upstream regions, upstream. But it's not even that's good because upstream of what, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. upstream of the AUG. All right, we oh, need a new word. Yeah. And the other is, future work will be needed to redefine what in reality a gene is. Why do we have to redefine a gene? What is a gene, folks? <laughs> well, heard, we've heard this um, debate. A uh, lot. You know, the first thing that pop, <laughs> first thing that pops into mind there is that, you know, we have. Uh, I'm not an expert at this, but there's a lot of bioinformatics that goes into trying to figure out from sequence what a gene is. You know, what's the mm. what's going to be the canonical, you know, we've been arguing about the canonical translation start site since the beginning of time, okay? Yeah. And it's, uh, as time goes on, it seems to be getting muddier and muddier, all right? There are, there are uh, start sites that are used much more abundantly than others, but obviously there's subtleties, okay? Uh, and you can get these spandrels, if you like, mm. okay, by using uh, other... Start sites. So from that point of view, yeah, we have to rethink how we're going to define a gene, I suppose, because a given sequence uh, can have uh, manifold effects in terms of proteins down the So one of these the little open, let's say you have a 20 amino acid open reading frame that has some function up there in the five prime region. Is that a gene? Uh, that's the question. What, what do you want to do? Because we can, we can establish it right I here want, now. I want to go have a <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> okay. Well, that's how you would, you sit down and you talk about it, right? Right, right. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, I'm, I'm reminded in a way of the discovery of microRNAs. Yeah, are they right? genes? Exactly. Okay, we're discovering all of these little, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Variations on the theme, and we don't uh, that that they do have. I uh, got to hand it to them. They have the 
They have the effect of making you think about what is a proper definition. Yeah, no, I gene. think it's good. Yeah. And I also agree that as our understanding changes, we revisit definitions for yeah. sure, right? Yeah. No problem with that. Uh, I just, you know, object to making up words that don't, like, you know, interrogate the data. What the hell do you need that for? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, definitely redefine what a gene is. Okay. I found the uh, evolutionary biology definition of spandrel. Okay. It's the phenotypic trait that is a byproduct of the evolution of some other characteristic rather yeah. than a direct product of adaptive selection. Stephen okay. Stephen so Jay Gould and Richard Lewontin. It's not necessarily, not necessarily a, a non-functional thing. It's just something that arose as a consequence of selection on something else. Yeah. Okay. Right. okay. Right. Interesting. That's good. Okay. All right. Do you think anyone's left listening? <laughs> well, if uh, whoever is, good on you, because yeah. that was that was uh, you know pretty pretty deep into the weeds. But I think we've done a reasonable job of summarizing it at the beginning and as we went along. Okay. Yeah. And and you know, folks, this is this is seminal, I think, because it's going to lead to more, and that's uh, mm -hmm. part of the appeal for TWIV. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, for those of you out there who uh, want some sort of cut and dry, prepared, scripted mm -hmm. explanation of a paper and didn't get it, uh, that's the way this works. This is us sitting around in our offices in the morning, looking at this publication and trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Okay, this is the way science gets done. Right. I can, you know, we, I couldn't, I couldn't do this by myself. Right. All right. I need you guys to help me through yeah, this. Yeah, that's a. This is yeah. a and, our journal. And then club. we yeah. we go down the hall, or we contact John Udell and say, "And what about this?" Right. Because I have questions about them showing lots of upstream open reading frames, and not one of them ever has a methionine. So how can you say those are even translated? I still have a question as to whether uh, there's um, a some sort of uh, abundance of certain types of sequences that are snatched because that's what I got out of this mm -hmm. one figure. Yes. But um, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and if so, where that selection comes from is that yeah. the snatch ace, okay? Yeah. Or is there some yeah uh, some other issue? Um, one more thing I was going to say. Uh, oh yes, and folks. You know what the next pandemic is going to be? It's going to be an influenza pandemic. So start boning up on your influenza virus so that when it comes, you don't have to cram. <laughs> Last pandemic of influenza was 2009. Correct. So that is uh, 12 years. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What is this? Mm -hmm. 21. Yeah. So in the next 10 years or so, eight years maybe, probably going to be another one. Okay, let's do some email. Kathy, can you take that first one? Simon writes, Team TWIV, second cool day in San Jose, California. Nice break from the heat. Your discussion on the press and being misquoted was interesting. I'm a product manager in the tech sector and wanted to shed some light as we go through this often. So the first thing is we get special media training, which covers a lot of things, including remembering the press is not your friend, how to stick to the topic, don't show off as you will slip, things you didn't want to say, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. We even get refresher training. It occurs to me that many universities have media departments, so scientists could easily get in-house training. Another thing we know is that engineers can't keep secrets. <laughs> so many of our leaks happen, including to competitors, but also the press analysts, etc. Not by the people that are supposed to talk externally, but by engineers. Worth noting is that there's a type of media that acts less reputably, deliberately targeting people to try to get them saying things they shouldn't. These days, of course, sometimes you get training on social media as well. On a separate point, as product managers, we are taught to think about the audience. As you yourselves have commented, even with science language, sentences and words get used in different ways with different meanings. As such, it's critically important to check the person correctly understood what you said, not just that they say they did. Read back is essential. We often review articles written for us before they go to print. Anyway, I start to think every degree in science needs to have a module on communication with the public, and definitely postgrads need support in this space. 
We cannot expect people to get these skills without training. All really good points. Yeah, Simon. all true. Yep, especially that last one. I agree with that 100%. Yeah, you're not going to get it. You're not going to just pick it up. No. It's a great point. Uh, Rich? Charles writes, hello, Twivers. Really nice day in Chapel Hill, low 70s with some sun. If you thought moving away from full-time coronavirus coverage would get rid of me, well, you were wrong. <laughs> okay, well, I hope you're still listening, yeah. Charles, because <laughs> we're reading your letter. <laughs> I hope the same is true for most of your newbie listeners. I really do enjoy your long-form podcast, including the weather and the various times TWIV becomes TWIG or uh, some other topic. Okay, to my question. Taking what I think I learned from TWIV 754 and combining that with a few other TWIVs and other sources, do you think we could make an effective mRNA vaccine for dengue fever? If experiments like uh, those talked about on TWIV 754 could be done on dengue fever viruses to find epitopes that cause antibody-dependent disease enhancement, could mRNA be designed to instruct cells to build modified virus proteins that are missing these epitopes? Thanks again for the COVID-19 coverage uh, and a nice introduction to the other viruses. Kathy, you've been thinking about this, it looks like to me. Well, I just, I just simply look to see, because I know that I've heard... Uh, Drew Weissman talked about a variety of things for which mRNA vaccines had been worked on or were in the works and stuff. And um, so I found this review article, or I think it's, what kind of a review could it be I was talking about earlier? Either is it a, a systematic? systematic review or a literature <laughs> review. I don't know what the difference is. But anyway, um, then they described that three groups have recently described dengue virus vaccines using an mRNA platform. One in 2019, one in 2020, and one in BioArchive 2021 by the authors of this uh, review. And so one of them is targeting conserved T cell epitopes in the dengue virus one non structural proteins. Another one is a, a dengue two um, for the envelope protein. And then if they add NS1, they get better T cell responses. Um, and they do induce some cross-reactive immune responses resulting in high levels of antibody-dependent enhancement in in vitro infection of K562 cells. Didn't really know that you could measure ADE. Yeah, so what you, what you do is um, put FC receptors on cells, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, you pick a cell where the virus does not get in because it's, there's no receptor, and then you put... FC receptors, if they're not there, and then you can put antibody, a non-neutralizing antibody, see if it gets in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then the this third situation that they're describing is their own work where uh, they encode PRM and envelope proteins with promising results. And um, the dengue virus one virus induced more antibody-dependent enhancement than their messenger RNA treatment. So that... Mm sounds promising and that's in mice so, so, so i'm sorry go ahead Kathy. yeah so anyway so charles um uh good thinking and some people are working on it so stay tuned so the idea is is to uh have a closer look and uh selectively identify epitopes mm -hmm. that might do what you want and not do what you don't want right. and cobble those together into yeah. a messenger yeah. rna vaccine yes good thinking charles you got it. I want to mm -hmm. just point out that the, you need to have, in addition to the spike, you need to have non-structural proteins for T-cell immunity because the first dengue vaccine, Dengvaxia, they took this, the, um, the envelope and M -pro PRM proteins and put them in a yellow fever backbone. So the only dengue proteins are surface proteins and that for serotype 2 anyway gives you ADE and that's probably because the you needed T cells against NS1 as one of these papers shows and now if you make the entire 
dengue vaccine using old dengue proteins. You don't have that issue. So, yes, you could make mRNAs combining some of the, the structural proteins in addition to the, the NS1 or whatever you need for T-cell epitopes. Yep. Interesting thought, actually, that you know we might wind up with messenger RNA vaccines where the messenger RNA was itself uh, a chimera, if you like, of viral mm -hmm. epitopes that, you know, bears very little relationship to anything that you would actually find in the virus, but delivers the epitopes that uh, do the trick. Yeah. It's almost like a, almost like a peptide vaccine, but not really. Okay. Because you were actually synthesizing the peptides, uh, uh, during the immunization process, which has has uh, effects beyond what a peptide vaccine would have. Yeah, a lot of possibilities. And yep. now with with their newfound profits from the mRNA vaccines, uh, you know, Moderna and Pfizer, you, you should go ahead and do this other stuff. Got a lot mm -hmm. of money in the coffers now. Mm -hmm. Well, and it would be nice to have continuing government support for development of vaccines and vaccine platforms for diseases that uh, uh, really are uh, potentially a threat, you know, rather than just waiting yeah. for it to actually strike. That's the yep. CEPI content, yep. uh, con CEPI. Uh, uh, mm. sorry, concept, this which is, is to yeah. identify threats and get the development up to the point where they can be deployed very yeah. uh, rapidly if they strike. Gary writes, hello, TWIV scientists. I was amused in, I believe, episodes 750 and 754 at your attempts to define cows, cattle, and in general, some animal terminology. Jens was exactly right in his description of agricultural terms, although the term oroch is probably only used by scholars involved with taxonomy. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Jens. <laughs> Having spent most of my life in animal agriculture, I thought I would provide you with a cheat sheet should you delve into it again. These terms are mostly what is used in the U.S. as too many terms change as you go abroad, i.e. piggery versus hog farm. Yeah, in, in uh, Malaysia, they call them piggeries, which I happen to like. I think it's a Yeah, that's cool nice. Word. I like that. This list is not all inclusive, and these terms are not really set in stone and are dependent on industry, colloquialism, region, and time. Some of the ones I mentioned may already have fallen out of general use. However, the attachment is just to help you get by if referring to animal agriculture on TWIV in the future. By using them, you will come across as even more brilliant than you already are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Gary... Um, sent a Word document. I'm going to send it to all of you because I just pasted it in here, but you can stick it somewhere and then use right. it. Right, have it for reference. I have viewed and learned from every episode in the past 17 months. Thank you for providing factual science-based information. Continue the excellent work. work. Gary is from Palmer Lake, Colorado. By the way, I became a patron quite some time ago, still waiting for the mug. I'm sorry about the mug. Uh, send me your address, Vincent at microbe.tv. I should set up the Patreon in a way that automatically sends your address, but I haven't. It's just one of the many things that have fallen by the wayside. Anyway, this is a wonderful list of livestock, including cattle, swine, sheep and goats, poultry, horse, equine, you know, hunky, horse, donkey and mules. So let's go through the cows. A beef cattle is cattle raised for human consumption. A bull is an intact, not castrated adult male. A cow is an adult female that has had a calf. However, in parens, that's not always accurate. A farmer might say, go check on the cows when referring to a herd with cows, heifers, and steers. Also, cowboys do not just deal with females. <laughs> so, wait, this farmer says, go check the cows, and he or she means whatever I got? Yeah, cattle. <laughs> The, the herd of cattle, yeah. Then we have a dairy cow, a female specifically for milk production, almost always Holsteins. Productive life of three years. A heifer is a young female before she's had a calf of her own and is under three years. Calves are young cattle of both sexes until they're weaned. Steer is a castrated male. Ox, a castrated male. Occasionally a female kept for draft purposes. Now, Plural I had no oxen. idea. <laughs> I didn't know that. I guess if 
if you don't castrate them, they get nasty, right? And so, you know, yeah. when you want them to pull your cart, they'll kick you or something. Right. So an ox is just the same as a steer from that standpoint. Except it's used to pull carts, yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. And the steer you're going to eat at some point, right? Okay. And then gomer bull, a vasectomized male used to find cows in heat in a herd. <laughs> That's really specialized, isn't it? <laughs> A gomer. So I guess you could use that named uh, offensively for people, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. He's uh, just a gomer bull. Yeah. I Any like others, the, you guys? Uh, I like the uh, the just the list of terms uh, under goats. Mm -hmm. There's a teaser, <laughs> a buck or a billy, a doe or a nanny, a buckling, a doling, a kid, and a weather. Yeah, p pigs, a lot of different pig names. Swine, pig, hog, boar, sow, gilt, piglet, wiener, shoat, and barrow. Wow, shoats. I hear, yeah, I've read a shoat. I never knew what a shoat was. I don't, know, um, I don't think my brain has room for this stuff. I, I guess I could, uh, you know, tack it up here on my wall. We'll have geese, a, a geese. We'll get into a big arc on animal names every time an animal comes up. <laughs> I'll send you a uh, laminated copy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, geese have only three different names. The few is gander, goose, and gosling. That's cool. Uh, that I can deal with. Mm -hmm. There's no swans in here because swans have interesting names, right? Yeah. Yep. They've got horses and donkeys and mules. A donkey is a common name for a member of the ass family. I could see that being used for people too, right? Yes. A jack, jack or a jackass is an intact male of the ass family. A jenny is a female of the ass family. It's so weird to, to be using ass scientifically, you know? Mm -hmm. Mule is a hybrid resulting from breeding a jack, a donkey to a mare, a horse. And a hinny is a hybrid between stallion and a jenny. I didn't know that. A hinny, I didn't know. Yeah, and uh, one of those is sterile, if not both of them. Yeah, yeah I know mules are sterile, right? Okay. Anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Gary, I find this fascinating. I love these different names. Let's do one more round, Kathy. I have no idea. Oh, this is from Charles. I have no idea if you watch Jeopardy. If you do not, you may want to watch today's uh, Tournament of Champions show. That was May 25th, 2021. A question that had a significant impact on the game would have been answered by most TWIV listeners. Category, medical milestones. The daily double answer was, file under S in the 1950s, these two microbiologists each developed a polio vaccine. Medical milestones. The contestant could only name Sock. Oh, man. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> How about here? I could make up so many Jeopardy questions for <laughs> microbiology. Yeah. I don't know uh, if that was the same Charles as the last one, but now we have another one from Charles. File under, here's one for you guys. File under H. He developed over 10 different human vaccines. Ah. Maurice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. And you know what, folks? This is why you should listen to TWIV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you but can play it, Jeopardy. Of course, what if you don't play Jeopardy? <laughs> Rich? I'm just uh, looking up. To, I sent you guys that cartoon, didn't I? Of the new uh, game show. Uh, yeah. About uh, uh, that. I forget what it was called, but uh, it's not about facts. Where the caption, it's a game show set up and the caption is uh, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Bob, you got the right answer, but uh, Joe uh, shouted out the, uh, his opinion louder, so he gets the points. Mm. Okay. That's right. Yes, you did send us that. And, uh, and Mary objected to the answer, so she gets a point too. Took offense, that's what it was. Right. All right, Charles writes, hello, Twivers. Just a lighthearted email from sunny and warm North Carolina. 91 Fahrenheit, 33 in Chapel, 33C in Chapel Hill. Should be cooler this weekend, but alas, I will be visiting New Jersey where it looks like I am in for some rain. Who knows? Maybe I will get a great hot dog at Max's in Long Branch and just watch it rain at the shore. Well, you know what? The cool thing is you're traveling, right? Yeah. 
Um, we uh, th things are looking up. During TWIV 759, there was talk of bubbles, cults. <laughs> Here we go. Manual transmissions, deprogramming, schizophrenia, and uh, apophenia. So I thought because my last name is German and apophenia comes from the German word uh, apophany, and the term was coined in 1958, my birth year, who better to put it all together with meaningful connections than me? <laughs> so here it goes. Oh, Charles is really uh, uh, totally clued into TWIV. So here it goes. A cult is just a bubble of people that share a common crazy idea. The people may not be crazy overall. In fact, most would not stand out in a crowd. Professor Rosenfeld let the world know that Professor Rack and Yellow belongs to the cult of three-pedal driving. I was a proud member of the same cult for 10 straight cars. I thought those outside my bubble, from inside a cult, it always looks like a bubble, were nuts. <laughs> they spent more money, got less performance, and used more gasoline than I did. An added bonus was I was more engaged when driving. Another advantage, in recent years, a manual transmission has uh, made a car almost theft-proof. All good things. But times change. The new automatic transmissions are much better. They still cost more and are not as engaging, uh, but they get better miles per gallon and better 0 to 60 times, and the resale, uh, resale value is much better. So how do you deprogram a member of the three-pedal driving cult? You get them to drive an electric car. An EV is the opposite of a stick shift car. You want to accelerate, you just press on the accelerate and the accelerator and the car just goes faster. No shifting by the driver or the car, one exception, the Porsche has a two-speed transmission. No muss, no fuss, just a smooth acceleration from an EV. If Professor Rack and Yellow is too deep into the cult to be deprogrammed, he may want to check out National Stick Shift Day, July 16th. And he gives a link to that. Holy cow. Um, thanks for the shows, Charles. Uh, well, Charles, thank you. I have to say that uh, I am a member of the same cult, uh, though I've been sort of beat out of it because you can't get a stick shift anymore. They're almost I, impossible. I, I, I got one uh, last year. I had to finally turn in my Beamer of 12 years with 250,000 miles. It was a six-speed. It just was breaking too much. And I found a three, four, I found a 2017 uh, Mini Cooper with a six-speed used. Is that right? The Minis are making <clears throat> um, six-speeds. So is Subaru. Um, uh, currently. They're actually currently making these? Yeah, the Minis is still... I don't think Beamer makes sticks anymore, or it's a special. Or you could go to Europe and get one and bring it back because they make them over there for sure. Because mm -hmm. there, it's a cult. I have to say, I really enjoy. I'm not gonna. I haven't got many cars left in me. I'm not gonna buy an electric car. I love shifting. I love the sound of the engine, accelerating and decelerating, especially when you downshift. I love the acceleration. I love the feel. It's just. I don't, you know, I'm sure electric cars are great, but well, as long I have as they're to, making them. Uh, I have to agree with uh, Charles that an electric vehicle, <laughs> uh, I own one now, uh, is a completely different realm. Yeah, okay? I'm sure. Uh, in, in particular, when it comes to torque. I have never experienced anything like it. Okay. It's, a, it's an amazing and smooth experience. We're about to drive ours 3,000 miles uh, at least. Actually, it's about 2,400 miles to Oregon. We'll drive so you, back. you map out all the charging stations on the way? Uh, the, the car does it for you. You tell, you, <laughs> tell, you, t you tell the car where you want to go, and it nice. tells you where to stop and for how long. Yeah, that's great. So I visited Rich in 2019, right? And at the time, his wife still had her Beamer, and, uh, and she was going to get rid of it for— uh, well, She gave it to your kids, I think, right? Sarah, uh, Sarah's driving it. And it was a stick— was a manual transmission and I said how can you do this but she did it and I'm like you know I the car was in great shape I mean mine was falling apart but man well you know this was uh, it, it was a compromise because we didn't really get rid of it because we gave it to Sarah okay yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. actually uh, Ib, Ib drove in it the other day with Sarah and she said it was uh, 
a trip down uh, down memory lane. I have to tell you, I'm when I dropped my car off at the dealer to get pick up the new one, I was sad, man. Oh yeah, they yeah. they took the plates off and drove it around, and it's sitting there. It was raining. Oh, and it was. I so, went out so took, lonesome. I went out and took pictures of it, <laughs> and I, I mean, I almost felt that it was a person. That I was abandoning. I was twelve <laughs> years. I drove that car, two hundred fifty thousand miles. I never changed the clutch. It's the same clutch. Wow. Which every time I brought it in for service, they said, "Holy crap! What are you doing? How do you?" And I said, "I'm just driving the way I was taught." But I still, to this day, okay, the Mini's a nice car. Acceleration is nowhere near the Beamer. Nothing like. Uh, the, I mean, I know it's the same company, more or less, but it's made differently. And that uh, it was a great car. It's the best car I ever have. It was a 2000 and... Is it 2007? Is that 12 that's what, years uh, old? That, that's what um, uh, Ip's car is. It's 2007. 2007. It was silver and the inside was black leather and the dashboard. It didn't have that fake freaking wood that I can't stand. It just had a strip of aluminum. Oh, that was the coolest thing when the guys rolled it off the truck when I bought it. And it paid I paid thirty two grand for it. <laughs> and it lasted anyway, I'm sorry to go on. Well when I uh <clears throat> when I taught my kids to drive, uh we had a a Camry that was a stick. So they all learned to drive a stick and they complained the whole time. Okay. But uh having having learned it, they now uh thank me for it. And uh Susie tells this great story of uh, going to <clears throat> Greece with a, a bunch of friends, several friends, uh, in, including a couple of these macho male types, and they had to rent. They wanted to get around in some island in Greece. They had to rent a Jeep. The Jeep had a stick. She was the only one who could drive it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I used to bring car to garages nobody had trouble driving it at a garage i guess at a garage you learn yeah, quickly you learn. how to how to drive yeah. sticks right yeah yeah when i took driver's ed they had one volkswagen bug for us to drive in and the other people in my car were guys <laughs> and i was the only one who could drive it really well from All the right. get-go cool so very good yeah my half of my cars have been stick shift so i had only one uh my first car was a Fiat, an orange Fiat, which cost 2300 bucks new in 1974 or something, two, three, something like that. And all the way through the car, and I've only had one nonstick, one year, and Audi stopped making sticks. And I really liked Audi, so I bought a, uh, it had a, uh, the paddle thingy, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, I hated that yeah. so much. You could switch between automatic and paddle. Oh, it sucked. I got rid of it immediately. But I've had all sticks. I just love them. And why is this? My my father didn't drive a stick here in the U.S. In fact, you know, he loved manual. He loved automatics. Although when we went to Italy when I was eight years old, <laughs> he had to drive a stick, right? And um, he... Couldn't remember how to drive it properly. He was always grinding the gears, and I would sit next to him and laugh, and he got really mad at me for that. So I don't know where the idea of driving a stick came from, but when I got my first car, I wanted a Fiat, and I wanted a stick, and then it just stuck. I really liked it. And the thing is, I went to get the car. I had no idea how to drive a stick. I had just been thinking about it for weeks, thinking about pushing in and shifting, and I got in, and I just drove it off, and it was fine. Must be hardwired, Vincent. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, because my dad it's grew a, up in Italy. It's a, some sort of, a, you know, an upstream, untranslated region that's, <laughs> you know, it's making, <laughs> yeah, a, well. it's making a, what are they called? Span Spandrel. Spandrel. And you know what? One more thing. I don't know for what reason I drove a truck once and it had the stick on the column. Holy cow, was that amazing? Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. I thought, how can I drive this? It's not a, it was so easy to do and it was really fun because yeah. it's a really big throw. Yeah. <laughs> In the old days, this, the thing used to be on the column, even of yeah. cars, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I never had one of those. All right, one more email. See what you did, Charles. You got me into my <laughs> cult. 
I have to say, Charles, uh, Charles actually corresponded with me offline um, last what year. Was it? When did I get this damn car? I don't know. <laughs> last year. and the, But the year before, I'd been talking about it, and he sent me a lot of um, tips. <clears throat> Kurt writes, hi, hi, Vince et al. I don't like Vince. Don't call me Vince, please. It just seems weird. <laughs> Vincent works, or Vinny, if you really like me. Do we know if seasonal flu existed before 1918? I've been wondering about this for a long time. I've not come across a satisfying answer. There might be a paper out there that addresses this, but I haven't been able to find it. How could we investigate this? Is it even possible to know? I expect an RNA virus would be hard to recover from exhumed remains and death records couldn't distinguish influenza for, from coronavirus or others. So there's actually an extensive literature on this. And there, yes, there have been a pandemics going way back and um, must be seasonal flu as well, right? If there's a pandemic, there's going to be seasonal in between. There's one paper that I'll include in the show notes, um, which is using our known sequences of flu genomes to do back clock calculations, you know, and you can, this one is by Warobi, Han, and Rambo, a synchronized global sweep of the internal genes of modern avian influenza virus. And you know, we did that actually on, on TWIV. And there are other papers you can find where they go back even further, even historical papers. There's, I found some where they say in 1525, there was an outbreak of influenza. I don't know how they know because, <laughs> yeah, it would be hard to distinguish from other respiratory viral infections. But you can do serology also. You know, I don't know how long people have stored serum, but I know you can do serology in the late 1800s and know the HN subtype of the virus that was circulating then from the serology. Um, but, you know, earlier than that, I don't think we have sera. Were we talking about a, a paper that was uh, on the wait list that was going to look at more flu sequences? No, in 1918, from, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, one can, uh, Kurt, recover sequences from exhumed humans. Okay, yes. and other and other uh, sources. So yeah. it's not easy, but it uh, it can be done. Which is how the nineteen eighteen a nineteen eighteen sequence was recovered some years ago. Uh, although that, it's not uh, not nothing earlier than that in terms of recovery. Although you know, it gets better and better. Who knows what they're going to do? Who knows? Right? <laughs> okay, what they're going to do? Actually, that's if, another paper. Uh, that uh, is on my wait list anyway, is some uh, ancient pox sequences from the Viking graves. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? I remember that. There's a yeah. whole, I've got a whole, I got a whole episode in a folder somewhere. Okay, we can do that sometime. Just get it out there and we'll, we'll do it. All right, let's do some picks. Kathy, what do you have for us? Uh oh, I'm, I'm, uh, you goofing I'm off, Google. Kathy. Right. Oh, well, I was looking for other things. Oh, yeah. I picked the flat pasta that turns into shapes. So first was a New York Times article, but uh, it linked to the primary research article, which evidently the authors paid to get it to be open access. And the idea <laughs> is that um, if you put grooves into things, like if you just think of, uh, think of linguine or, or what's fatter and uh, wider and flat, but, uh, but if you put grooves into that, then uh, you can do uh, things where it'll make the pasta just automatically go into different shapes. And so they talk about quantitative experiments and multi-physics simulations that parametric su surface grooving can induce temporary asynchronous swelling or deswelling and can transform flat objects into designed three-dimensional shapes. And why would this be useful? Well, it could improve the efficiency of certain food manufacturing processes and facilitate sustainable packaging of food by creating a uh, morphing pasta that could be flat packed to reduce the airspace in the packaging. Think like going to Mars, maybe, I don't know. Um, and so they uh, tested this both with pasta and this material uh, made of uh, some kind of silicone family thing called polydimethylsiloxane. And um, they do movies of it. 
And because this is open access, I highly recommend you go and download these movies. And the first one, uh, there's a couple of them. You can actually, uh, uh, you can see like little uh, water or air bubbles on the pasta in the in the water. But the very first one, you actually see a noodle in a boiling pan <laughs> on the stove. <laughs> it's, it's just great. So... Um, Check it out. Uh, <laughs> they have these beautiful rose-colored, uh, rose-shaped things, and and spirals, and it's just fascinating. This, this is this, great. I can't believe there's a science article on pasta. That's great. <laughs> this is great. You know, this is all about the packaging, so that you could flat package it right and get mm -hmm, more. Mm -hmm. And they say in this science article, the plastic material used in food packaging packaging is a major contributor to landfills, mm -hmm. and so. Finding effective packaging is important. Um, that just then they say pasta is, is a great example because you know some of them are really big. Like my one of my favorites, rigatoni. Man, the boxes of rigatoni are huge. Yeah. They say pa pasta is widely known for its unique texture, mouth feel. I never thought of that. It mm -hmm. really feels good yep. when you're chewing it. Mm -hmm. But by the way, this plastic in food packaging, I um. I found the the only cereal I could find that has no plastic, it's all paper, is shredded wheat. Hmm. <laughs> the big yeah. ones come in a cardboard box and the, they come two per um, paper bag inside mm -hmm. of it. So we mm -hmm. buy that now to try and cut down on You know, it's weird plastic. to think, but yeah, I do the same thing. I shop based on the packaging mm -hmm. uh, wherever I can. It's weird to think back to uh, the pre-plastic era. Yeah. You know, brown paper bags. Wax paper yeah. sandwich bags. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all all this plastic is just not necessary. I see people uh, uh, going out of the store in front of me with a shopping cart that is must have thirty or forty plastic shopping bags in it, in yeah. addition yeah, to all the food yeah. packaging. Yeah. Uh, it's just unconscionable. I can't believe it. Yeah, it's, it's not really necessary. No problem. Yep. That's cool. I mean, do you think, Kathy, the pasta is will taste just as good in these shape shifting forms if they if they make it with a good right. semolina flour it, yeah. it should should be yeah. fine that's so cool but they ought yeah, to have all these they ought to have all these equations on the back of the box yeah. so that you can yes. do the math <laughs> while you're eating it right. and you know then you're going to want to look at it as it boils and changes shape right yeah. that's going to be oh, part yeah. of it, it yeah. adds and then, to the whole you know, thing half of these movies are also the the relaxation so, yeah, it, goes, so cool. it kind of goes back to its ori original shape. So. Very cool. Very cool. Rich, what do you have for us? So this is probably a repick, but I at least wanted to update it in 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 particular in light of all of the mm. stuff that's going on nowadays. This is the uh, uh, Ed Fonte's media bias chart. Okay, um, Ed Fonte's is a uh, an outfit run by a woman who is an ex, or maybe even an active, I'm not sure, patent lawyer, uh, who this started in, actually, I, kept, I, I have not only the site here, but a link because I cross-reference everything to a Wikipedia article on the same thing. Um, her name is Vanessa Otero, uh, and this started in uh, 2016 where she was interested in trying to somehow at least um, uh, illustrate and to the best of her ability quantify bias in the media and came up with this uh, media bias chart and you can get a hard copy or you can get an interactive copy and you can get more and more detail if you uh, give them money. Um, uh, but what it does is uh, examine, and they now have a staff of like 20 people or something like that that try and, I mean, this is hard because you're talking about trying to make the inherently subjective objective, okay? Uh, but they have a staff of people who read articles and somehow score them for both accuracy and political bias. And then there's a chart that on the um, ordinate charts uh, accuracy from... Uh, strict fact down to uh, uh, myth, okay? Uh, and on the <clears throat> abscissa, plots political bias, okay? And you get a 
sort of an inverted U-shaped thing where at the very top are outlets that simply report fact, like, for example, AP and Reuters, okay? Uh, and on the wings, both uh, right and left, you get things like, uh, there's some things here on the left that I'm not familiar with, like the uh, Palmer Report. Uh, there's the Alternet. There's Occupy Democrats. That's not, it's pretty far left, but it's not totally unfactual. Then they have uh, over on the extreme right, they got uh, on the bottom InfoWars, which is basically, uh, you know, just toxic nonsense. Uh, and then you can pick your favorite news outlet. It's great. You want to and figure out it's what great. it is. So I don't know how accurate this is. Hmm. Um, yeah, right. uh, it has a truthiness to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I find myself referring to it frequently because uh, mm -hmm. I'll read some article on Facebook or, uh, you know, something somebody sends me and I'll wonder, hmm, uh, what do people think of this? And uh, also it's interesting to see, uh, you know, how uh, the, the a judgment being made on how biased some of the things that I ordinarily watch are, okay? Because there's bias, there's slant both left yeah. and right. You know, it's interesting that the farther to the left or right you get, then you start to go down in yes. whether it's accurate or not, yes. right? The more so the polarized, most left, yes. Yeah, the most left and the most right, they're the least accurate. They're right. in the, you know, in, inaccurate information. That's interesting. Right. So what you want basically is in the middle-ish, roughly, uh, not yeah. too far left or right, right? Well, and, but there's one, one or two exceptions, and one of them is the National Enquirer, which mm -hmm. is very low for uh, truthfulness, but it's pretty close to the middle. Skews a little bit right. Oh yeah, that's right. Bias. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> just contains inaccurate and fabricated info. And then you have World Truth TV, which is only slightly right, but is lower than the Enquirer. And what yeah. a name, right? World Truth TV. Great. Hey. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is cool. I don't remember you picking this, but this is kind of, yeah, really important. It's, it's, it? uh, it's timely. And I would, you know, I think it's important that people understand that uh, the sources that they're reading uh, have, you know, certain levels of truthfulness and bias. And this is a, this is a reference document. You can have but a look at it. Of course, people who don't agree with this will say that. Uh, Media bias or whatever the company is is too far left and, on their own. Right? Exactly, exactly. As a matter of fact, there's a really from Wikipedia says here uh, news sources that were rated poorly on the media bias chart have been critical of the chart. Alex Jones, founder of the right wing conspiracy theory site Infowars, said Ed Fonte's charge represented quote di uh, the dying dinosaur media's extreme liberal bias. <laughs> uh, as the chart classified Indo's <laughs> info wars yeah, as right. nonsense damaging to public discourse. So, depends on who you are. That's pretty cool. All right. My pick. Okay, so, I haven't read a book probably since 2019. A book meaning, you know, well, like detective fiction, which I used to like to read. And I'm in my view, the best detective fiction is written by the Swedes. Um, there are a bunch of them. And my f one of my favorites I started reading in high school is called the Martin Beck Police Mysteries. And it's it's written by Mai Showal and Per Walu. I think they were married for a while, and then they got divorced, but they kept writing together. <laughs> um, and it's quote, the first one is Rosanna. And it goes on and on. I've read most of them. And then, I don't know, two, three years ago, I started reading them again because you could get them on a Kindle. And I just love them. They're just, well, they're translated, of course, but something in the translation that just makes them very straightforward and not flowery prose. And I really like it. So if you like crime fiction, this is Martin Beck is a, is a cop in uh, Stockholm. And this is... Uh, you know, his career, basically. I really like them. And of course, there are a lot of other good ones. There's Henning Mankell is another more contemporary one. Um, and there are more others, but um, really good. And this is not science at all, I understand. But um, 
it is really good uh, writing. So I will put a link. Yeah, the, the link is that I have there is the uh, Microbe TV Amazon site. So whenever I link to books or anything in Amazon, I usually use our Microbe TV affiliate link. And as far as I know, no one has ever used it except me. Uh, Have you used it, <laughs> Kathy? No. Yeah, I use it for other stuff. When I'm going to Amazon, um, I use the affiliate link. I will check this out. I'm, a, I'm, uh, I'm into a lighter reading phase, you know, having made it most of the way through Janeway's immunology and halfway through the Civil War <laughs> and a bunch of other biographies. I'm into some, in, in looking for something a little lighter. This will be good. I mean, these are very short. You could knock them yeah. off in a couple of hours. Great. And I just find the prose is really nice. It's straightforward, but you get, you get to learn the characters for sure. And um, the, the puzzles are really interesting too. So if you like detective fiction, um, I mean, there's a lot of great American detective fiction. Um, and I have to say my, my, my old friend, Paula Trachtman used to love detective fiction. And so when I went to MIT as a postdoc, she was there as a grad student. We always used to talk about, it. she loved Martin Beck also, <laughs> as, as, as well as some of the hard boiled American writers. Right. The girl anyway. with the dragon tattoo, what, weren't those Scandinavian authors as well? They were, yes, yeah, they were. Who wrote those? Let's see. I'm just looking at it here. Um, Stieg Larsson, that's another one, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He's another those good one. Those are really one. good. Yeah, I've read those in the book form. Yeah, they're really good. And Henning Mankell um, wrote a very famous uh, series. Let me see if I can remember. Um, let's, let's, let's search for Henning Mankell. It's been um, made into... Uh, Ooh, Kurt Wallander. Kurt Wallander so this series, is the yeah. Wallander yeah. series. Okay. That's the Wallander one. Okay. Yeah. Really good also. Uh, yeah. Really um, good. Who's the guy? The what guy? The, the, <sighs> the actor in the TV series for Wallander. So there are two. There's an old one, then there's a remake. Two different actors. Yeah, the remake is this guy I really like. I'm blanking on his name. Who was married to Emma Thompson. Kenneth Branagh? Yeah. Yeah. So he did the remake, and then there's an older one, uh, which is also good, but different. It's just different. Excellent. But I don't know. There's something about Scandinavian crime fiction that I just really like. They All do right. it really well. So uh, we have a listener pick from Greg, listening to Q and A with A and V, and hearing Amy complain about those weighing in on the lab leak theory. Reminded me of the classic Stuart Lee bit. "Quote: A lot of people think the Loch Ness monster doesn't exist, don't they? Now." I don't know anything about zoology, biology, geology, geography, marine biology, cryptozoology, evolutionary theory, evolutionary biology, meteorology, limnology, history, herpetology, paleontology, or archaeology. But I think, long pause, what if a dinosaur had gotten to the lake? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You don't know anything about phylogenetic trees, yet you think it came from a lab, do you? While Dixon might not might might be able to do it justice, I do recommend watching Stuart Lee's delivery of this. And while on YouTube, you should probably watch everything he's done as well. Maybe consider buying one of his live DVDs. I've been listening to Twiff since March fifteenth, twenty twenty, starting with the amazing five ninety one episode with Ralph Barrick that I listened to as I drove my daughter home from college when campus closed. So it's really been the soundtrack to the pandemic for me. I'm only a chemistry PhD and a fake one at that, a theorist. <laughs> so I find the discussion incredibly valuable. The questions you ask when discussing papers, drink when Vincent says black assay, are to me just <laughs> as valuable, if not more so, than the content of the papers themselves. This podcast makes its audience not only better informed, but better consumers of information. Bravo. Thanks, Greg. So a theoretical chemist. So if you're a theoretical evolutionary biologist, you're fake. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. All right. That'll do it for TWIV763. Show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send your questions and comments. Love. We love getting them. TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you really love what we do, consider supporting us. It'll make you feel good microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. 
Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He is currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>